Amen. From the Gospel of John, chapter 20, Jesus breathed on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. Our lives lie stretched between two breaths, the first gulp of the newborn, the final exhale of death. Breath is life force. It is the very sign of life. Breath brings vibrancy and vitality. Breathlessness is the struggle with the task of life itself. On Good Friday this year, meditating on the theme of breath, Scottish journalist Anna Magnusson observed, breath is not a scientific word. Breath is a poetic word, a heart word. She spoke of her own childhood memories, perhaps shared by some here, suffering from what was then known as a weak chest, sitting stooped over a bowl of steaming water, head shrouded in a towel, in an attempt to ease her breathing. On a baptismal Sunday, here for Rufus and Hugo, I suspect any parent, newbie or veteran, could summon to mind moments in child raising when they woke in the middle of the night and listened anxiously for the sound of breath on the baby monitor. Breath. There it is, embedded in the Easter gospel, behind locked doors. Jesus coming once more to the disciples, speaking greeting, Peace be with you. Then breathing on them, or breathing over them, or breathing through them, we cannot tell. Receive the Holy Spirit. In John's Gospel, resurrection and Pentecost rolled into one. As with so much of the Gospels, the question for us is less how, or when, or even did this happen? Rather, to honor scripture, it is always the more profound question, what does it mean? What are we being shown or told through these pages? Breath, of course, has impeccable biblical pedigree. Jesus breathing into the disciples has clear echoes of elsewhere. The whisper of God in Genesis, breathing life into the dust of Adam, Later, the visionary valley of dry bones encountered by the prophet Ezekiel. The command to the prophet. Command these bones that they will breathe. Bring the wind from the four, bring the four winds and breathe into those that are slain. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered into them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army breath to transform the things of dust and the places of decay. And just so Christ enlivens the disciples, frightened and grieving and despairing as they were. And breath of the risen Christ has an additional poignancy, for ultimately in crucifixion, it is by suffocation that the crucified die unable to bear the weight of their own bodies, unable to fill their lungs. And yet we are told that in those hours of the breath being squeezed from him, Jesus still spoke words of forgiveness. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And to the one alongside the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Sometimes final words, and indeed the last breath, can be incredibly precious. Earlier this year, I received a letter from someone who knows this church well, not a member. She wrote about the death, or rather the dying, of her father. 
I managed to make it across the Atlantic in time to be with him. It was a great privilege, and I like to think of it as his last gift to me. We should all be able, sometime or another, to sit with those we love as they die. In some traditions and cultures, at the moment of death, the mourners open a window, symbol of the spirit leaving the room just as breath leaves the body. The breath of the risen Jesus is the hope that beyond breath there is something else, transformation, not end. For the disciples then and now, the breath of Jesus, however, is not primarily about afterlife. In the words of the Christian Aid slogan, we believe in life before death. So Jesus commissions his followers, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And retain here is in the sense of warn. Jesus gives authority to speak words of peace. But words of peace may either be sharp challenge as well as abundant forgiveness. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus' breath, God's breath, Holy Spirit, is given to undertake the task that the disciple could never do on his or her own. Again, mindful that this is a baptismal Sunday, reminder of the promises that we have all taken. What is the shape of this faith, this faith in Christ that we profess and seek to nurture in our young ones? It may seem a little random to speak of the individual I'm about to. All I can say is that her story was refreshed to me this week. And coincidentally, the events described happened in the same week, though in a very different context, that the dedication of the new St. Columbus took place, the 60th anniversary of which we continue to celebrate. On the 1st of December in 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks finished her day's work as a seamstress at a department store. At about 6 p.m., she boarded the bus to go home like she did every working day. She paid her fare and sat down in the first row of seats that were reserved for blacks. When the front of the bus reserved for white people filled up, the bus driver moved the colored sign behind Parks, then told her and three other blacks to move to the back to accommodate the white passengers. Her three seatmates moved. Rosa Parks did not. In her own words, when that white driver stepped back towards us, when he waved his hand and ordered us up and out of our seats, I felt a determination cover my body like a quilt on a winter night. When he saw me sitting still, he asked if I was going to stand up, and I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, if you don't stand up, I'm going to have to call the police and have you arrested. I said, you may do that. We know that the bus driver called the police Parks was arrested for violating the segregation laws. She was also fired from her job. 24 hours later, a friend bailed her out of jail, and her quiet act of civil civil disobedience jump-started the Montgomery bus boycott. The non-violent protest lasted 381 days until the Supreme Court ruled against bus segregation. In a contemporary biography of Rosa Parks, two common myths are dispelled. Firstly, that she was some kind of meek or accidental heroine. 
In fact, Parks had been an active member of the civil rights campaign since 1943. Again, in her own words, people always say that I, that I gave up my bus, sorry, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired. But that isn't true. I was not tired physically or no more than I usually was at the end of a working day. I was not old, although some people have an image of me as being old then. I was 42. No, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. And second, her refusal to give up her seat was not the random act of a single day. In reality, she dedicated 60 years of her life to political activism in the cause of social justice. That political activism and civil 